Thanks for the introduction, Dylan. Um, I'm Graham. This is Kevin. Just quickly to profile RJC, we're a um, specialty structural engineering and building science firm across Canada with over 450 employees. Uh, Kevin and I are based in the Toronto office. Just a, a bit of a background on empirical methods that I'm sure many of you are familiar with in terms of sizing slabs to control deflections traditionally. ACI 435 and 318 both acknowledge the use of span-to-depth ratios for slabs. But when you dig into these, you see that these are really independent of loading and material properties and, and these sorts of factors. And the question is, in 318, we have the maximum slab deflection limits, but it's, there isn't a clear link if you're sizing your slabs on span ratios, what deflections you're actually getting. Are you pushing the limits or are you something else? So the, the common discourse we hear in the field of slab deflection calculation is that the traditional tables are independent or are based on traditional slab systems with normal loads and normal materials, but we don't really know what these normal conditions are, especially the way that we're trying to build larger span structures and with thinner slabs and that sort of thing. And then if you move to ACI 435 and you want to then get into calculating deflections, there's often warnings about the variability of creep and shrinkage data and the inability to really accurately calculate deflections. But the basis of our presentation today is really saying the reality of our profession as we're trying to design structures that span larger and are more efficient is that we, we do need to be able to calculate real slab deflections. Some of the reasons for this are protecting the brittle elements by calculating incremental long-term deflection, calculating total long-term deflection so that we can accurately specify cambers and not per general notes as the example that Dylan spoke about. We're also starting to see that owners are specifying deflection limits that are more stringent than the L over 240 or L over 360 in ACI. As Dylan mentioned, once we're designing structures with spans of 12, 14 meters, deflection of L over 360 or L over 240 becomes a big number that is impractical and becomes noticeable. So on longer span structures, we want to limit to a fixed number and not a span ratio. We're also trying to take advantage of more prevalent high strength concrete and high early concrete strength mixes that have higher moduli than traditional. And then the issue of loading, what is normal loading, and then construction load cases, being able to take that into account in our analyses. So we're going to talk about how we go about calculating long-term deflections on slabs. And I really want to emphasize that in everything that we're doing, we are following along with the intent of the ACI codes as a reflection of our practices. First of all, ACI 318 requires a rigorous calculation of inelastic crack deflections. So we're using the SAFE software, ACSI, which is a nonlinear cracked finite element analysis with the cracking moment of inertia calcs per ACI 435 approaches. And then we talked previously about variability of creep and shrinkage data, and that's well documented. And ACI 318 does acknowledge this variability, but does provide us with a closed form equation for uh, long-term multipliers. So we're using the software simply to calculate instantaneous crack deflections and then applying the appropriate long-term multipliers from ACI. ACI also recognizes, and further to Dylan's presentation, in calculating uh, long-term deflections on slabs, we really have to do a nonlinear time history analysis accounting for early age properties, early age loads during construction before we get to applying our design loads with our 28-day properties of the slab. So again, we're using our safe analysis to do multiple analyses under different material properties and different loading conditions and pulling those values out of the software and then doing a proper summation of those values um, using these equations. I'll turn it over to Kevin now. Thanks, Graham. I think that this is actually excellent because the previous presentation is kind of right in line with a lot of the content that we uh, are going to talk. So I'm going to try and shift gears a little bit. We had a big case study at the end, but I think just given some of the comments that have come up and the methodology that we're utilizing, I might just sort of tweak this a little bit. So one interesting thing, I guess, to sort of take a step back at a high level and look at the uh, time history approach is there is this sort of contention that construction loads may exceed the design loads and obviously we don't agree with that per se but we do agree with the, the previous presentation that they often get very close to sort of the design loads that you're going to see in the field 
Basically, the way that this is handled in our practice, and it's sort of a Canadian standard, is that you know our spec and our general notes and typical details are limiting the formwork loading, and we're sort of stating, at least in our practice, the assumed numbers of levels of reshore for a particular design. And then we've often worked with contractors to adjust those levels of reshore to sort of suit what they're looking to get out of a particular formwork cycle. So the methodology that we've employed kind of allows this flexibility where you can account for all of these sorts of things in analysis. And it's really not all that complicated. Really what we're doing along the way in a post-processor is just looking at the amount of cracking you're going to have at each stage during construction and service and carrying forward the appropriate crack stiffness into sort of the next sets of, of component loading. So one thing that SAFE is a little bit tricky with is, is it kind of doesn't necessarily, depending on the way you're going to set it up, give you that sort of direct time history behavior. And that's sort of why we've elected to run a construction loading case and an in-service loading case. And we're taking the larger degree of cracking or the lower effective stiffness at each point in time and carrying that through in a post-processor. And then further to that, whether we're looking at, say, total, and, and in Canada, by the way, there is sort of limitations on total deflections, and then we also focus on incremental deflections long-term after finishes go in. So depending on whether you're looking at total or you're looking at incremental, that long-term multiplier that you're actually utilizing is going to be slightly different because at different points in time, you've got a different multiplying factor that you're going to apply to each of those components. So I'm obviously not going to stay on this slide for too long. This is just sort of, we've taken these generic equations which have sort of been published based on the Canadian code, which is very, very similar to what's in ACI. And we've kind of pieced together a program that has a lot of ifs and ors. And you're basically simply running your safe model and inputting those data from two separate runs into a post-processor that gives you the right stiffness along the way. Again, further to Dylan's presentation, the way that you can handle the sort of shoring cycle and amount of reshore in safe is simply by determining a distribution of construction loads. So the, the model that we have basically has service loads in it and it has construction loads in it, and you're running it twice. And the purpose for the second run is that at least you have the sort of luxury and safe of specifying whatever you'd like for FR and whatever you'd like for EC. They're independent of one another, and they're independent of the uh, F prime C that you're going to use for strength. So basically, we're running the, the program in such a way that in both runs, you get the correct amount of design reinforcement, and then you're varying FR and EC to suit what values you're going to have at an early age in order to get that cracked stiffness from the construction history out. One way to look at this is similar to exactly what Dylan had presented. Assuming the shores are relatively rigid, you can come up with a distribution that sort of leads you to believe that each of these slabs are going to be relatively equally loaded. Now, interestingly, there's often discussion about the effect of the shoring system itself on this load distribution and the effect of, you know, the varying degrees of cure for each slab. And again, we're sort of advocating that Sometimes there's this perception that we just don't have enough information, but quite simply we do. We can make a very reasonable and conservative assumption about the cycle speed from floor to floor. You know, we've calibrated our sheets to make some reasonable assumptions about what your cycle is and what your shoring is, and we state those assumptions on the drawing, and we can always go back and revisit them. And in more sort of complex scenarios, we're actually going to run a multi-level assembly, say in something like SAP. We're going to take the cracked parameters out of SAFE in a post-processor, put them into SAP and we can vary the stiffness of the shores. And all that'll simply tell you is what that distribution is. So maybe it's not a third, a third, a third. Maybe, you know, the first slab, if the shores are a little bit more compressible, takes a little bit more than a third, but then the lower slabs are a little bit stiffer because they've cured for a bit longer. So simply by tweaking that distribution, you can basically change your construction loads in your construction run to get that crack stiffness. Interestingly, because, you know, again, in our practice and in, in Canada, it's standard to strip slabs at 75% of F prime C, you basically have, if the code equations hold true to, to Kate's point, you have a pretty good estimate of what your E and FR is going to be along this cycle. So you can kind of see if these concrete properties hold true, that you're sort of roughly 10% variation in FR and E. Again, this is for a typical scenario where these slabs would be similar span, similar thickness, and therefore have roughly the same stiffness. And they've also seen the same loading history as well. So if one slab cracks slightly more than the other because of the relationship between the shores and the cure, most of these slabs are going to see that behavior as you're climbing up the building. And, and one thing we would like to point out is because you're specifying a stripping strength, or at least that's our practice, Kate's data at one day is, is actually very interesting that it's showing that 
the equations are starting to hold true. But I think the interesting point is because of the way that this is specified, we're not really saying that we're looking at 30 MPA at 28 days versus 30 MPA, you know, that same mix to sort of what degree of hydration and cure you've seen at one day. There's basically like a hard target that the contractor has to achieve. So a lot of times this criteria will necessitate that a contractor is going to be specking a slightly higher 28 day strength to achieve the stripping target that's been provided. This is just simply an image of what we're doing. We're basically taking instantaneous crack deflections from SAFE. We're post-processing them in a sheet that we've set up to hold true to those equations that we'd uh, noted before. And, and actually, to the point about specifying moduli, we have started doing that. It's not super common in a lot of our markets. We certainly do it for tall buildings, for the lateral system to the gentleman's point previously, you know, differential shortening and, and that sort of thing. But we do see in the Canadian market in particular, a place like Edmonton has really spongy aggregate. And these equations have been proven not to hold true. So, you know, operating in these different markets across the country have kind of led us to that philosophy. And we're also specking different performance targets. So we're not necessarily even specking concrete strengths at 28 days anymore. We're shifting to provide more performance criteria to the concrete supplier. I think it's sort of informative to just go through a rough case study. And the, and the point of the case study was more to sort of illustrate that these days you're getting pushed into doing things that you simply can't utilize the span to depth ratios to achieve. So this is a screenshot partially of a floor plate from a 38-story office tower, which has recently been completed. The structure topped out in the spring of this year, and they started pouring the first typical floor about a year and a half ago. The typical module is 45 feet by 30 feet. We essentially, in a lot of Canadian markets, PT is not a, a competitive system. So often we're pushed to sort of band and slab systems or beam and slab systems or some sort of hybrid plate, which is what we've actually done here. So we simply pulled the columns in board for a 30 by 30 foot bay, and then we have about a 16 foot cantilever. We spec'd two different performance criteria for the mix. This was partially accounted for in slab deflections, but it was also to deal with puddling and some other design issues along the way. And interestingly, the outline spec for this building required a live load, which was higher than the code minimum. So again, to Graham's point, you know, what is a typical load? What is a typical span? And you know, these span to depth ratios aren't taking into consideration your concrete strength. And when we were sort of selecting an analysis methodology, we quickly determined that span to depth ratios might give you a good starting point, but they're not going to sort of solve this particular problem. And again, because it's a bit of an unusual configuration, just sort of saying, well, we've done one like this before. So, you know, that's a good starting point. Probably wasn't a good place to go either. Frame analysis kind of has its limitations. And I think it's just that local curvature at the slab edge. We had actually contractor and owner prescribed deflection limits on the slab edge. And it's hard to sort of capture those real two-way curvatures with some frame analysis hung off one another. And then later in the, in the process, we actually had a climbing screen scenario introduced after we designed the slab. So we elected to use SAFE per the methodology that we had discussed before. In the Canadian code, we are limited to, to 240 for total long-term and 480 for incremental. The contractor wanted a maximum deflection on the slab edge of an inch. So we basically have these multiple performance targets where we have a basic slab thickness that's thinner than a span to depth ratio would give you. We have variable concrete strength and performance criteria. So again, how does that link in with a span to depth ratio? We had tapered drops where the extent and the depth of the taper was atypical. The cantilever was very long. So again, to Dylan's point, what's your span in this situation? And we just wanted to point out that the Canadian code does use half FR for calculation, which is in line with the 4.5 versus 7 root F prime C that's in ACI. So our, our final design, we actually ended up with around 22 millimeters total on the slab edge and about 30 millimeters on the, uh, on the backspan. I'm really going to have to power through this because it seemed to make more sense to focus on some of the shoring and reshoring methodology before. We basically wanted to sort of deal with the cantilevers. We've put together like a, a sort of phony logic process to illustrate where we're coming from on this. This isn't actually how we sort of came up in practice with the final design. So what's the span? Well, let's ignore the cantilevers. We came up with a 250 slab. We used standard drop panel sizing and we took the depth of the drop panel equal to the slab we ran it and you find that you know in this scenario that these deflections would correlate roughly with the limitations in the table span to depth ratio wise so okay maybe this is a good starting point we reintroduced the cantilevers obviously three inches of deflection along the cantilever edge isn't going to work so we parametrically increased the drop thickness we saw that that did start to reduce some cantilever deflections but with diminishing returns, 
So then parametrically, we increased the drop size to 16 foot by 16 foot, and we saw that we're actually within tolerance right now. And all this we sort of did for this particular presentation in the course of a couple hours. So these software packages do offer you an intuitive way to kind of visualize what the slab is doing, and they allow you to sort of quickly run multiple studies to kind of envelope where you're they allow you to optimize, but as well as envelope, because you can sort of run multiple runs quickly. So simply, we took this volume of concrete in the drop, and we optimized it to give us the best lever arm and the sort of the stiffest curvature on the cantilever. And basically, that's what we came up with was this tapered drop that tapers to about 750 mils at the column and 100 mils at the edge of the tapered drop. And then we parametrically reduced the slab thickness from 10 inches to 8 inches and arrived at our target. So after all that was done, the contractor, who we actually worked quite closely with, we looked at you know, two levels of reshore versus three. We provided them different tolerances for each so that they would understand what that meant for leveling screed, finishes, and everything else. They wanted to introduce a large climbing screen, uh, which imparted some very heavy loads on the slab edge, and that's not typically done on these sort of cantilevers of 16 feet. So we used that methodology that we described before, where we're doing sort of a hybrid safe sap analysis to understand and make some recommendation in terms of the amount of reshore. And then this is just a little snippet from one of our assumed deflection and shoring notes. So this sheet actually has our lateral displacements, our slab edge displacements. It has different configurations of the climbing screen throughout the time history of the slab. And it allows the us to work with the contractor in an upfront fashion to sort of determine what we need to do in order to not throw a bunch of additional reinforcement at this problem and allow them to carry forward with using the screen. In the end, it all worked out very well. Unfortunately, we spec detailed survey, and in Canada, it's not commonly provided. So the best that we can tell you is that nothing was out of spec. And after about a year and a half, everything is, is well within tolerance. We sort of would like to use this as a more detailed case study whereby, you know, we'd like to get that survey data and actually compare our predictions to what they saw in the field. But as Dylan noted, in the end of the day, there is a lot of inherent variability in this type of calculation. And from our perspective, we're just interested in adhering to a rational code framework in order to meet all the appropriate code clauses. And it is really just an issue of communication, as Dylan mentioned, to our client and to the contractor to sort of understand what you're getting and how much inherent variability there is in that product. With that, I think I'm probably out of time. Quick question. Sure. Based on that reshore diagram you were showing, did you have continuous Oops. reshores all the way down to the foundation at the edge then? Is that no. what I'm seeing there? No. I think originally what had happened was we had gone back and allowed the contractor to, our assumption basically on the front sheet was three levels of reshore, which is common in Canada for a residential construction. Commercial construction sort of hovers between two and three just because of the you know higher loads in a commercial building. So at one point during the design, we actually let them use two. And then when the climbing screen came in, it became prudent to sort of reintroduce the three levels of global reshore. And then we've got an additional three levels just along the slab edge. So that diagram is basically what you're seeing there is just three additional sort of local props around the slab edge. And that was sort of the system that we ended up with. I mean, it's not perfect, but that's sort of why we took that extra effort and basically ran iteratively SAP and SAFE and then kind of accounted for all of that in a multi-story scenario.